Hey, Dylan. Hey, Mike. Dylan? You like sticking things inside other things? Uh, these these things never go well when you start out with a question like that. It's just <sighs> you don't even humor simple. me anymore. I'm not. There's no romance left to this here whatsoever. There, the relationship there never was has gone any cold. In, you don't even in play. This podcast. This is not a podcast about romance. Ah, uh, the fire has died. You think is that is that the XNA framework you're talking about, or is this? Uh no, that was dead last week. Okay. Um. And let's every, face, something has let's, to let's die every it. week. What we've probably been doing with XNA since um, Windows Phone 7 counts as necrophilia. You know, it's really kind of been dead for a while. We just didn't acknowledge it until recently. That's creepy. That is creepy. Um, yeah. It's not good. We've probably screwed over our sponsor. <laughs> this is not a <laughs> conversation we should have had as we start oh. off of it. But it's live, baby, and we roll with it's, it. It's not like our... our our episode title last week was Death of a Framework. Well, you know what? Link bait. Link we bait. need the clicks. That's what we're here for. Sweet, sweet. At we're not getting any. No, let's just stop this now. Hey, Dylan, you checked out that Sunburn Framework? Yeah. So uh, last week we talked about uh, using the high dynamic range HDR, HDR features plugged in there. Processor. Now, the cool thing is that you're gonna, you you checked into is that that's not the only option, right? Um, no. Well, as far as post-processing effects go... In there's, fact, there's an unlimited number of options. Well, yes, you know, provided you're willing to um, do some coding. There, But uh, the, the post-processor framework, um, I believe it's actually... Post-processor is actually an interface that you can, you know, subclass and create a uh, an interface for. Um, but, for example, if, if you go on synapsegaming.com, go to the community section... In the community blogs, there's a section, uh, there, there's a post within the past month or so where, uh, you know, a developer is actually talking about creating new post-processor effects for sunburn, such as uh, radial blur, motion blur, depth of field, and things like that. And he's actually got some uh, video up there. I think they're looking at, you know, putting some code up from the comments. I couldn't really tell. but So you could write a plug-in, essentially, you could. to extend features of that. Right. You could put in the bokeh. What's the bokeh? I don't know what the fuck the bokeh is, but people you could go create it. on and on and on about the bokeh, about like some kind of hexagonal effect of photography when you like screw it. I I don't know. I've looked at photos of like here's with and here's without, and like I I, I thought don't bokeh know what was I'm a looking. type of burger. Um, it's B O K E H. Oh, that's bokeh. Else. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's apparently a big deal, and that's why I'm not a good game developer. If I understood what the Boca was, and I'm probably butchering that right now, so, probably so not even the way it's said. So you're claiming that you could create this, but you don't know you what the interface create this. is. That's what I'm saying. You, the listener, could create that and be an awesome game developer. And in this case, like, you don't want to be like Mike. Don't be like Mike. Get the Sunburn Gaming Engine, plug in the Boca, and be awesome. Make millions of dollars. We don't even know that the post-processor is, is the area where you would implement the bokeh. I think it is. It is like a blur okay. effect. All right. Well, then... But it's not maybe. a Gaussian blur. I get that. Get the Gaussian blur. Down with some Gaussian. I can... I can... I can de-Gaussian. Remember you hit the little monitor button and go... Yes. Wah, 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 wah. Like, you know, I, I can... I can... Wah, wah, wah on that. But, you know, I understand all of that. Got knowledge filed away on all of that. But no idea what the bokeh is. But you could write that and you could plug it into the Sunburn gaming engine. Yes. And if you're curious about how to do that, go learn more at synapsegaming.com. All right. Welcome to the show, everyone. Um, before I introduce our guest, I think we need to talk about B for a little bit. Okay. Something we don't do often enough on this show is talk about me. It's so rare that there's a segment that I get to have on the show. Sarcasm. Um, this I week, just sit back and go whatever. You this know, week I spent a massive amount of time it. moving sites over. Yes. Uh, long story short, we were cheap sons of bitches, and Sysoft Hosting sent an email and said, "Hello, dear sirs, won't you pay us seven hundred dollars so that your sites continue to function dear as sirs. they have in the past?" Yes, I'm quoting verbatim here. And um, I said, "Oh, good day to you, sir. You know the uh, the tea is lovely at this time 
however, as you know, in our previous engagement, it is only $500 a year, not $700 a year. Please rectify this obvious oversight, and we will pay you forthwith. And they said, no, fuck you, you're crazy, you're wrong. At which point I said, no, here's the fucking invoice. See where the invoice said, um, annual reoccurring discount. Annual reoccurring discount. discount. Boom, we're down to $500. Oh, that was a one-time discount. And I said, no, I hear you're using these words, but I don't think you know what these words mean. <laughs> annual reoccurring right. discount. Let's break this down. Annual. Year. Annual. Annual. Right? That's per a yearly thing. Reoccurring. Happens more than once. It will reoccur. It reoccur will happen again. annually. There's an occurrence that reads. And, you know, it's a discount. It's an off the top. Perhaps thing. it was a discount on an annual recurring billing account, but the discount itself was not. So essentially, I am such a wonderful personality that I was elevated to the president of the company emailing me back. But essentially, he was going, I'll give you 60 bucks off. And I was like, you can take your 60 bucks and shove them where the sun don't shine. shine. Okay? That's what you can do with your 60 bucks. Because now you have pissed me off. And laws of the internet state that once I am pissed off, I can go to extreme lengths just no, to not pay no, the bill. No, no, So we went to extreme lengths to not pay are, the bill. Are you saying the laws of inter the internet are basically uh, <laughs> how to become a horrible, horrible person? Yes, you are allowed to beat up any customer service representative on the internet that is a right given to you by Jesus. That is why he died to you on the cross <laughs> so that you could be upset at anyone who works at any form of tech support whatsoever. They don't have to work in tech support. If you have a question and they answer the email, you can get upset at them. So uh, I think Jesus and Internet Jesus, like Internet Jesus is like, you know, Jesus is like, turn the other cheek. And the Internet Jesus is like, once you have hit them on the first cheek, go find that second cheek. Actually, just beat the crap out of them. <laughs> Find his home address and post it all over the internet. Physically turn the other cheek by hitting it so you get yes. to it. <laughs> Spin his head around. Oh. Two cheeks, one cup. There you go. And one cupped hand. One cupped hand. Um, and so essentially, uh, we found Bluehost. Fucking love Bluehost because Bluehost is like, hey, we're unlimited, and I'm like, yeah, you're not fucking unlimited. And I got him in chat, and I'm like, okay, what, what, what about like all this? I'm like, oh no, we're unlimited. What about all this? Like, oh, we're unlimited. I'm like, okay, what about this? Like, unlimited. What if I upload like all these images like day one? No, we're unlimited. Okay, what if I run like ten sites under your thing? Haha. -ha. No, we're unlimited. We are unlimited. I'm like, really? So you're unlimited? All right. So what are your limits? Because you know, I obviously don't believe that they're unlimited. Yeah. And like, well, we're small to medium sized hosting. If you get crazy big, we'll have a conversation. And then I was like, oh, that's fair, because we don't do shit for traffic. So, yeah, that's fine. That's fair. I just want to have a bunch of tra sites that don't do shit for traffic, though. Um, I'm kind of... I'm a lot of fish in a small pond. Yeah. I'm a school of guppies. <laughs> <laughs> On the internet, I'm a school of guppies. By this point, it's not a small... Like, Jesus. It, it's not a small pond. It's like a, a huge pond, and everyone has their own school. This is what Guinness brings to the podcast, by the way. Um... <sighs> Uh, so, the, oh yeah, so they did say like, well, you can only have 100 MySQL databases. And at that point I was like, well, that's awesome. You know, and first of all, it's like, yeah, you're not going to be unlimited on everything, but like only 100, that's, that's plenty, you know, for 5.95 a month. Yeah. Um, and they were even cool in chat to say like, okay, so understand like when your intro package is up that you will go to our full rates. And here's a link to our full rates. Like, they were completely, like, not hiding, no shocks next year. Like, we want you to know Surprise, how Surprise, we $700. Well, the thing is, like, next year it'll go up to, like, eight ninety five or seven ninety five a month uh, if I don't up multiple once at a time. Oh, no. But, yeah, I was like, oh, wow. So we moved all oh, the this is WordPress sites Linux that we have to that site. But that left in the lurch Xbox Indies and GameMarks.com which are custom-developed ASP.NET uh, sites, which we obviously couldn't host in a Linux-based hosting environment. Uh, I do not enjoy the thought of trying to port these things all to PHP. I, and yeah. Then it occurred to me, it's like, hey, um, we're kind of a startup company. We, we have a company. We have an LLC. Um, we're not that old. And there's we're BizBark. We're successful. Uh, yeah, and, you know, BizBark, you know, BizBark is like, are you making less than like uh five hundred thousand or hundred thousand dollars a year? Like, that would be awesome if we were making. Yeah, that. I'm worried about negative 
amounts per year that we're making right now. So, you know, check on that one. We're less than three years old. So we got BizSpark, and the plan was like, we'll get BizSpark, and we'll move to Azure. Um, but then we didn't realize, like, there's a waiting period to get into BizSpark. And then, like, getting Azure activated was the second thing. And then we thought we would take advantage of Azure VM roles and just do an Azure virtual machine and move everything over as is. And we realized there was another approval process for that. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, like, if you do a VM in Azure, it's got to be a stateless VM, so you still have to deal with Azure storage. No, I, we still have some recoding of the app, basically, to do. Yeah. Time ran out. And since I kind of told um, SoftSys Hosting where they can shove their $60 discount, really wasn't in the whole, like, hey, you guys don't have a monthly rate plan, but can I have a month, please? You know, just to hang out, because I didn't quite uh, get they off. All I thought they did have a monthly rate plan. I don't know. It probably would have been anal rapage at this point. Yeah, like, well, yeah, definitely. You know what? You could pay uh, six fifty a month. How about that? That's your rate. <laughs> no, because uh, in my day job, we were looking at moving some of our servers out of a, a data center that we paid for, and we looked at Softsys Hosting, because I knew you and one of our friends were using that, and... We weren't yeah. too sure about it. Uh, we looked at Azure, and um, it's a whole SharePoint, other weird, yeah, like, like, like VMworld sound cool, but SharePoint, you know, anything that has to be stateful, like SharePoint or th their examples were Exchange or anything that stores data on disk. I mean, to get to cut cut to the chase, to be in Azure means designed for Azure. Yes. Um, if just you totally cool. try to work around that, it's going to be painful. So uh, what we did is we kind of set the sites up in WordPress, and I apologize to anybody that got their RSS feeds reset a couple times because getting that set up and moving that over caused, like, at least my Google reader to identify everything we as new. everything, yeah. Um, so, you know, there was that for a few times, and then there was an issue uh, where it, it – one of the plugins that I'm using to aggregate in WordPress is duplicating some of the feeds. So I think most of that seems to have calmed down and, and it's going to work for a while to keep the critical stuff up and going, you know, the, all that. And then we'll get the games database back online uh, yeah. as we port um, things over into Azure. Again, it was uh, it was your hosting account. And so, I mean... Well, and, and we moved to a much happier place because yeah. we're paying like $200 for two years on Bluehost, which is fucking awesome. And we're getting, like, backup service included in that and everything. Yes. Um, so that's great. And then we'll be on Azure. We'll be in the cloud. We're all in. We're in the cloud, baby, um, for three years of BizSpark. And, you know, at the end of three years, there's nothing going to be a fucking X and A. So we're good. <laughs> this, oh, this has no that's downsides. That's going to be a meme. Like, you know, <laughs> say something good, say something bad. You can just follow it up with... But it doesn't matter because no, we're living on borrowed time. We are, we are dead man We walking. are definitely uh, yeah. on, on borrowed time. I guess this is what it feels like if you're a follower of Harold Camping or something. Let me introduce our guest who's been waiting patiently through my rants and ravings, uh, Nicholas Hansen of Defrost Games. Welcome, Nicholas, to the show. Hello, Mike. So um, I, I don't know if everybody checked out from the uh, site, but you guys are working on Project Temporality. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay. And now, now I watched some of the gameplay, and I and I and I watched some of the trailers. But for the benefit of the listeners and and kind of myself, like like break down the core mechanics that are going on in this game. All right. So the basic core of Project Temporality is all about time manipulation. We kind of looked at what other games have done with time manipulations, but not that much, and found out that pretty much every game seems to have a very limited scope of time manipulations. And we wonder, what could we do if we actually removed all the barriers and made it entirely free so you can actually manipulate time at any point, in any way, and make as many different copies of yourself as you want? You can actually... We even played around it. You can actually move back and front between different characters and change the movements of every character at any point in time. But we discovered we were actually working on it that if we gave a player too much freedom, it was impossible to make any interesting puzzles of it. So we are probably mostly inspired by the success of Portal that actually made it possible to make a puzzle-based game that is first third-person style. And we thought, that was really cool. They made a minimalistic game. They made it 
a couple of simple game rules that you could move on. And we thought, well, that should be possible to extend and make even with a different game. So we don't actually have that many core gameplay mechanics, but only this basic mechanic that you can move time forward and backward at any time, and you can spawn new characters at any time and simply give them new commands. That creates such a great complexity that we felt we had to keep the rest of the game quite simple just to get the user to understand it. We, even at this time, we recognized in all the focus test group, while the testers loved the game, they had a really hard time actually grasping the concept because it's just so much freestyle playing. You can find a lot of different movements, different ways to play and finish the levels. And this is also a big part of what we actually haven't shown in any trailer yet. The big part of the game is that it's actually a speedrunning game with online leaderboards. You have these single player levels that have a lot of story of everything in them, but the real game starts when you try to complete them in the shortest time possible. And to achieve this, you have a resource that you call time points. And you can use time points to spawn a new character, to move forward, backward in time. But you can also use them to accelerate your player's movement, speed, etc. And this causes a mechanic where they really have to select and opt out. Can I find a way to solve this puzzle in a more effective way so I can use more time points to speed faster later on? Or do I get a better time by actually spending more time points to solve this particular puzzle, but then I can't move from the level in such a fast way? I think that is basic mechanics. Okay, so um, yeah, you, you you mentioned so basically you're taking the the puzzle first at person acts and uh, first person uh, perspective puzzle game that that Portal kind of showed, and then uh, I think you mentioned in your your press release kind of a taking and, and expanding upon the braid concept of time manipulation. Now, when you said um, multiple characters, is that you you have actual different characters to control, or is that you take your character and then duplicate them by manipulating time. Well, at the moment, it's it can you can think that it kind of works like a recording device because what you can do is that you can record a lot of actions and then you can then you can re tweak time forward and backward and there you spawn a new character and at the moment you only have control physical control over the latest character you spawn because if you could jump backward and forward all the puzzles would be so easy but we might actually add that you can go back to a different timeline and retake control of that character and re and make new actions for it again it's okay, all so, depending on focus testing so like in some of the later levels of braid uh where you had your shadow um like you would go through and then your shadow would, it, when you rewound it, your shadow would make all the moves that you just did. And then your braid character could go on and do different moves. So that's, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, it's kind of like that, just on a completely different level of the amount of complexity and uh, possibilities of recording. Yeah, I mean, I well, so just introducing like the third, 3D, the yeah. third 3D is going to get really interesting. Um, so I mean, this this really sounds really really cool. I mean, this sort of sounds like something. Um, and and so you mentioned playtesters. So where where are you going through playtesters? Just local people that you know, or or through the community forums, or how how are you All doing playtesting? Play Basically, to make a really good playtest, I feel that it's important that you actually are there and can watch the person playtesting it, because what people say after we finished playing through five levels after an hour or two and got to actually feel while we're playing the levels are actually quite different. This is why a lot of game development studios have mirror glass places to make their testing in and cameras recording the faces of the players and everything. And quite frankly, we don't have that, such an advanced setup, but we do all our play testing physically on spot so we can watch the player the entire time, time write down where he had problem, See, did he look interesting? Where did he lose interest, etc.? So I actually have a good situation because I am a teacher at a game development school at the moment. So I have a plenty of students there that I can just call out. So hey, does anybody want to be a playtester? Then we have to sign the non-disclosure agreements, etc., etc. 
and then I can just take them with me and test them. Then we're very friends and family, so I don't think we're ready actually for a public playtest yet, or probably for quite a while, because for me, using the playtest forums, it feels like you go there when you have a level of polish that you're comfortable to, to get out a wider group of people and get that final polish. But uh, I think it's important to play test often. I would love to be able to do it every week, but to be honest, as an indie developer, we don't make enough progress every week to wear on the play test. We have two sessions so far, I think like one and a half month before Dream Build Play, and then the last uh, week before the Dream Build Play entry, and since then, we have been working mostly with technologies. We haven't really had a playtest, and we're looking up to make another one in a month or so. Just to get op op options in, see where it is too hard, where it is too easy, etc. So um, in your playtesting, are you at the, the stage where you're playtesting the actual uh, level designs and refinement, or are you still, like, we're playtesting the, the core mechanics um, and still building out the game? I would say that we are more, mostly playtesting the actual levels at this time, but if we are introducing some new game mechanic, of course we have to test it too, but the feedback from everybody who tested the game has been pretty good, so we're not that worried about the core mechanics, it's more about how fast do we introduce this, how do we get the player to not forget how to solve a puzzle. We learned that we have to have a lot of repetition early on because the, else the players could not get it. I think possibly we had at the middle of level one is at the end of level three right now, and people still sometimes have problem with it. But it's a hard balance because if you make it too easy, it doesn't feel rewarding. I think that's one of the parts that made actually Portal so great, that they actually managed to make you feel smart through the entire game. Even when you're doing a simple thing, like just using a Portal to teleport across water, somehow you still felt like, I figured it out, I did this good. And that's the feeling I think is most important to bring to the player, that he feels smart through the entire game. He feels, yes. I this made is, this. Uh, this. This will be a drink point for anybody playing the, the home game. But, yeah, it was mentioned in, in a theory of fun that people want patterns they know and recognize with one small little change. And then that way it's easy to figure out the change and adapt to the new pattern and get the feeling of joy that, oh, I figured out this, this change. I feel good, you know, because I recognized what this was, this setup, and then spotted the difference and then got to the level and, you know, I feel good. And then the next level has a slight change that I don't know, and then figure it out going on. And it's not too big of a change that I feel frustrated because it, it took a lot of effort to figure out. Um, and it's not just simply the same pattern I've always seen, which is boring. Uh, you know, where you get boring, so that's your frustrating and boring. Uh, now, these, these, these testers that are, are giving you good feedback, how many of them are actually your students? Um... I would say that I guess so far like 30 to 40 percent would have been my students and most of ours have been students from other classes that I don't teach. We have, we have both programmers, we had artists in. We actually haven't had anybody from the level design class in so far. And then of course family and friends has been testing it too. But You might have to on your own students when they say they love the game, you might have to give a little asterisk. You know, you might have to give a little asterisk and like look at their current grade and see if they're trying to get, you know, another point or something. Uh, That's not a problem because I'm failing most of them anyway. <laughs> Dude, yes. <laughs> no, but what we do with a playtest actually is that we don't ask them that much about if they like the game, what they watch. We more observe them, and you can watch at the face if a person playing, is he, she really into the game? Is she sitting here? You can really see the wheels turning around in their head when they're trying to resolve the puzzles. And to be honest, we aren't really failing most of the students, but <laughs> that's not really a concern. But that's a big part of why we don't do a lot of interviewing for a playtesting course. What people tell you might be very biased from if I know you, but what they actually do while they play, they really can't uh, 
we really can't fake that because when we're playing, we're into the game and you can observe them at that point of time. So uh, when you're watching somebody play test, what would kind of be your advice uh, to some other developers who want to who want to do this more? Like, what are you watching for? What have what what actions, what behaviors are you watching for in the, in the play tester, and what are you equating that with um, in your play test? The most important part is I watch their face to see: do they look interested? Are they bored? Do they look like they're having fun? Since that's the main part, do they feel like they're connecting with the game? Except for that, it's kind of like, when do they start looking bored? When do they start looking frustrated? Because uh, even when you're watching the game, sometimes a player gets hugged, stopped at a point that can't get any further, but he still thinks it's fun playing it because he actually likes the challenge. But sometimes it's like, ah, I don't know what I should do. And it's not like they say it, and we're not extremely obvious about it, but if you watch a couple of these playtests, you get to pick up these kind of things pretty quickly. There are a couple of good books on this subject. I can't really recommend them, because to be honest, I haven't read them. I learned this while I was working at the Ubisoft Massive in our playtest chamber, which had all these fun parts with the mirror glass, the camera setups. We didn't go as fancy as valves. We didn't have any brain recording or anything like that, but you can get a lot just by watching and observing. And then after that, you can actually ask questions and follow up based on what they did on the games play. So instead of a formula where you ask a couple of standard questions, you can ask, at this point in the game, you did like this and this. And what did you think? So, uh, what, what are, I know you said you didn't read them, but what are, what are these books? Um, to be honest, I'm not really sure about all the names, It's but if you look in user research category, there should be a couple of them. I don't really remember a name at this point. I have seen a couple, but I guess you could get most of these various kind of books that tries to teach you how to, how to learn, read body language body language, and they're mostly, I guess, aimed for people trying to get better at interviewing and that kind of stuff, but they're just as useful for this kind of thing. So basically, any of these learn to read faces, learn to read bodies book will help. Okay. Um, if you want to email, I'll, I'll put them in the show notes. I mean, I kind of like, I, I like personally reading these kind of things that aren't specifically game, you know, related, but are related like we do the same things and it's kind of interesting like we do this process play testing observe body language and let's read this book on general body language and then you know you, you can kind of adapt and apply um so that that's interesting i think i'll i'll look to to put some of that on my reading list because that's the kind of stuff i enjoy reading now um so uh let me ask you about uh on on your your blog uh you, you mentioned um, a press release debacle happened. What's the story on that? The story is that we were going to make our first press release for the trailer, and we were going with this idea. Let's make the trailer, the press release, an in-game announcement that actually are made in the in-game universe. So you set up this entire idea with one internal press release inside the game universe by an actually in-universe game character. We thought it would be cool, it would be interesting, and it would get other people to actually read the game because it's such different. But then we showed it around to a couple of my friends, which worked a bit in marketing, and they're like, no, 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 you need to have a grabbing headline at the top or else people will not read it. And then we got to learn, look, well, you have this elevator speech you use when you're trying to sell it in a 30-second speak to another guy. It's when you say it's black like portal meets bread on crack with avatars. Why don't you put that on the top? And we were, oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. I mean, I'm not really sure. Are we really supposed to put two other big games in the headline if you're an indie game and everything? But they said, no, no, this is where you're supposed to do it. And... To be honest, for AAA marketing, we're perfectly right. It is the way you're supposed to do it. But in the end, as an indie game, it's backfired a lot because a lot of people started talking about Portal and Braid instead of our game, and they tried to compare them. To, they thought we said that 
oh, this game is Portal, just with a braid element. And that's not at all what an elevator speech is about. It was about, in 30 seconds, giving somebody an idea what the game was about. And Portal meets braid is actually a good analogy at that time because we have the, it is based on a puzzle-based game in the first third person that I think Portal is kind of pioneered, or actually, we should probably say more re and reanim. No, what's the word? They basically made it popular again and made it a possibility. But because jumping in first person is kind of tough, you were actually going. We went for a third person view instead, and then. The most, of the, since most of the game is about time manipulation, and Braid is the most well-known example of that. We thought, well, then we took Braid, and then since our manipulation is on such a bigger scale than Braid for a user, we thought, well, we should add something that had that, so it's, it's a little bit of fun with on track. And then since we are using Xbox avatars, and we thought that was a really important point, we added that, because we actually thought that integrating avatars into a game can actually give it a good helper instead of just being, oh, something we put on the box. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people on the net wrote a lot of nasty stuff about it's not portal, it's Brady, and it has avatars. Oh, no. I think that, I think the description of Portal Meets Braid um, is a good description between developers, between heavy gamers, people who play a lot, as like shorthand of yeah. like, this is like Portal Meets Braid. I'm communicating a lot with a little here so I can get past the basics of its time manipulation and its first person puzzle based to start talking about the differences because that's what I want to talk about and but I, if you say that to wide of an audience where they're not hooked up on that wasn't the game description that was shorthand for the basis of this conversation to start it yeah. Then all of a sudden it becomes, hey, we're going to compare you to Portal and Braid, um, which, again, as an indie game, you probably don't want to invite the comparisons too much. Yeah, because those are such popular games that, yeah, people are going to assume that that's just link bait and not actually listen to what you have to say beyond and, that. And unfortunately, the press that cover indie games, um, they're not giving the indie game the benefit of the doubt. I, I think right. they're going to default to, oh, this game is, is cloning Portal, cloning, you know, whatever, and, and it's not doing either one well. It's a much easier, quicker story to write than to dig deep and figure out what's going on. Um, but I don't know. I, I think, you know, like in the way it was told and you talked to marketing people and they had a sound reason of why you would do it that way, and that's the way the AAA studios do it. I can't say that, you know, I would say you did anything wrong pre-knowledge or that I would have done anything different. It sounded good at the time. Again, laws of the internet. Yeah, laws of the internet. Uh, Can I take offense at something? Then I shall. Why wasn't I consulted? Um, now yeah. You guys do um, development. You, you mentioned teaching and all that. You're doing the um, development for uh, your games on the side. Is that everybody on the team It has a full daytime job? Um, most of the people has a full-time day job. It's kind of different going from person to person, but nobody's doing this project as a full-time job. But basically, I collect a bunch of friends from earlier days to help me out with it. So I make all the coding, and I, I would guess I spend like 20 to 30 hours a week, but that's beside my normal job. Then the guy who actually did the art for the trailer, he doesn't have a normal full-time job, but he wasn't really working full-time of a project. It's an old friend of me from Massive who helped me out because we lost two or three artists along the way because it's really hard to find a reliable artist that can produce enough content on a good schedule. So that's been the largest problem for a project. We actually got all, get, got all the art for the trailer like three days before the Dream Build Play deadline. We got the levels together. And for other guys, we have a couple of, we could almost call them contractors, like the sound guys, who don't work on, with the game on a daily basis. Um, other guys, no, everybody pretty much has something on the side so far. We 
hope that we will be able to move it to full-time development later on, but before that you need to have a really neat good demo so you can get in some money. I guess that is the key. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I definitely feel your pain about uh, getting a, getting an artist uh, to produce. Um, I, I, okay, I wonder what finger you were using uh, earlier in that. Is there something you're going to say? I, so I didn't hear that. I don't hear that. Um, this is a good beer. Hmm. Um, yeah. You need so, it right now. You know, and, and then part of um, having the, you know, the full time is you... you have limited time to work on your game, and therefore even less time Definitely. to get involved with the community. Yeah. Um, and that can be, you know, that's kind of, it's a frustrating thing. You want to work on your game, but, like, there there is beyond just, like, making an easier time through review and getting a better playtest audience. Um, being in the community is is kind of learning and helpful. Uh, you know, to hear about other developers that tried different things that worked and, and what didn't and talk on that. Um, and I know we suffer that as well. And then we also suffer a little OCD of, of uh, or ADD, I guess, ADD. of not like Finishing doing too many game. things and, yeah. and keeping, uh, things going on. Um, God, I could wish I could figure out a way to make this like the full time gig. Yeah. I, I, I you you pretty much have to have that first breakout. How about we just put a PayPal donation button on the homepage and then just everybody send me money? We could do that, but I don't think we'd get enough. We do kickstart game marks. What do we promise? Like what what happens? Uh, we promise. A game. Uh, we'll. <laughs> Why did you look at your we beer? Will when take you that said money that? and we will spend it on you know podcast accessories. <laughs> Uh, that'll do that. Um, let's news of the week. Um, of course, the top story continues to be the death or not death of X and A, the the state. Um, I don't think it's worth rehashing. I no. think um, I think since... we did a fairly good podcast last week on kind of just laying it out. Um, a little bit of, of commentary from us, but kind of laying it out and, you know, where, where the disappointment comes on. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, the most heart wrenching thing for me to watch is the MVPs. Because normally the MVPs say something like, you don't know the whole story. It's not that bad. You know, just chill out. You know, something yeah. like that. Something that translates to that. And that's not happening this time. Well, it's it's not just that we don't have any information on X and A. <clears throat> it's there are there's so many other factors at work, and we're just reading between the lines. And and these are maybe not decisions that Microsoft has made. It's it's not that they have made a decision. It's that they're not going to make. Well, a and here's another thought that I have. Build was launched, right? And they said, hey, this is a developer event. It just so happened to occur right before their uh, earnings call. Yes. And they invited all the press to there and let the press play on tablets. And I'm not talking about, like, Game Dev Mag. I'm talking about Time Magazine was there. And if it's a developer event, I'm calling bullshit on that one. Time is not there because it's a developer event. I think a little bit of build now. So I'm stepping back and I'm trying to say, like, okay, let's assume they're not total fucking idiots. Okay? It's a hard pill to swallow. I don't swallow. think they are. I mean... It's not a hard pill to swallow, but let's just, let's, let's just accept that. It's not that... It, none, of, none of the issue that we're having is that they're stupid. It's just their vision of what's coming. Well, I don't versus, know if their vision isn't stupid. Yeah. But step back and look at it. Maybe they're testing the water on some of this. Maybe the ideas presented of... We're going to cut this cord hard and shift all development over here. And we're going to do this whole Metro thing. And we're going to change the desktop to be this. Maybe they're going so extreme on this message at build because they're inadvertently or intentionally leaking it to a larger audience so that everybody covers the story of what the next version of Windows is to gauge feedback so that when CES rolls around, 
they'll kick out this next version of Windows 8 where they've kind of taken this feedback, although they say they're not doing that. You know what I mean? Right. Like they're, they're not after like, hey, we want feedback on what Windows should be. They're like, no, 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 it's this bold new vision. See how much you can get away with. Uh, yeah. And then come back. Well, no, no, think about it from Microsoft's perspective. How much they can get away with is an interesting way to phrase it. There's but... a lot of legacy code that they're dealing with. And to be able to say, we can cut the ties on .NET and start over with WinRT, I mean, you always want to do that as a software developer, right? Yeah. You always want to come into project and you're like, oh, I would just love to, to throw all this everything. away and rewrite it as it should be. And, you know, sometimes that makes sense. I'm not even saying this is a bad overall thing. It's going to be a painful birthing process. And I don't like not getting the battle strategy plan up front. So as a developer, I can make an informed decision. I feel like I don't have all the information to make a decision at this moment. Right. But Definitely. if this is the strategy, I can't say it's a bad one. Because what's, what's .NET, 10 years old? Are we, are we coming up on like a 10-year anniversary of .NET? Um, Thereabouts. I mean... It's close. Look at Objective C in Java, okay? Basically, Android and iOS, right? I don't know what's in the next version of Android. It's going to run on Java. I don't know what's in the next version of iOS. It's going to run Objective C. Uh, these are constants. However, because those are established platforms. Well, they're just as established as .NET. But the well, I mean, the however the is that these languages, these platforms, these frameworks are kind of frozen in the time that they came into creation. They haven't evolved as rapidly and taken advantage of many new things. Like where you can mix through like Link and things like that. You can mix functional programming inside of procedural programming now. Right. Um, you're getting to a point where you can do polygot programming, where you can basically mix languages within an application because this makes sense in F sharp, this makes sense in C++, this makes sense in C sharp, and I am no longer bound by my tools. Like that day is almost upon us of within the same application of using different types. And, and Microsoft gets some credit for that because they do move forward their technologies right. more rapidly. Um, whereas, you know, these others have kind of have stagnated and, and, and sat for the most part, um, and they have a lot of legacy baggage that prevents them from going forward as well. However, the flip side, the negative to that, is this very painful process of what about all the shit that I'm running now? How does that move forward? And it's like, well, if and I'm going to change everything... It's a rewrite, guys. Let's just be honest. That is one of the issues that there's been talk of, well, there may not be any technical reason that uh, desktop apps, apps couldn't run on ARM. That may be enforced by Microsoft. So, you know, I've, I've heard things either way there. So I think that might, um, that might be one of those decisions that they, you know, revisit later depending on the feedback. Um, I think uh, I think we just had a new term uh, right. invented. I don't know what we're going to apply it to. Element C Y there, um, pony corn programming. Pony corn. Did you watch the trailer for um, They Bleed Pixels? No, I'm not. Playing. Oh, I, I got to link the trailer in for They Bleed Pixels uh, for pony corns. Um, pony. This is a thing. We we need is that more like pony corn. My Little Pony with unicorn. Horns or something. My Little Ponies. But um, so this is something. This, but this is like a five-year-old phenomenon. This is a five-year-old like wanting pony unicorns. You know, like you want a pony and a unicorn. You want a pony horn. Uh, the same thing. It's like renaming. Yeah, but it comes from a five-year-old okay. and it's sweet and adorable and pony corn programming. <sighs> um, we'll have to yeah. enter a term on this. I, I think the difference with .NET is. The fear is that we're moving to a lower level. We're going back to C++. We're going back to DirectX. Um, but the reason... Yeah, there is a bit of, like, yeah. it's 2011. Why the fuck do I have to manage memory? I, I get that. I the, do get that side of it. The difficulty, though, is that, that WinRT is kind of hinges, and the whole Metro thing hinges on either Metro becoming popular on the desktop, people deciding, hey, I want to buy a lot of these apps. It could happen. Facebook apps have become popular. It, it's kind of a similar concept. Just, sure, add it, you know, little cheap apps. The other side of things is the tablet has become popular. One of those things has to work for this to take off. 
the benefit of .NET was it was something that they started rolling out across the board. You know, you could do server programming, you could do client programming. I think, though, um, in speculation territory, we're going to see WinRT roll across more. I think we're going to yeah. see it get that roll out. Um, I would be shocked if we go six months without an announcement that WinRT is coming to the phone. I think the only reason yeah. you haven't heard WinRT is coming to the phone is because they have some very important sales numbers they want to hit this this uh, holiday season, and saying there's going to be like this next thing come kills your current sales. You yes. cannot talk about that uh, in the next version. Uh, what did we break? We break Nothing. an iPad? Not a thing. We, we, we fuck up an iPad? Fine. Oh, yeah. You're not getting another one. Not in the budget. I know. Um... <laughs> the uh, and and don't you dare drop my laptop. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So, uh, Nicholas, what what with all the stuff that's been going on and the announcements, what what kind of has been your impression? What are, what are your concerns? I've kind of been looking like this. Like I think everybody is overreacting. If you look at Windows Eight and Metro apps. Sure, in the future, sometime it might be relevant, but look at how much time it taken people to get Windows 7. Look how much time it taken for people to get Windows Vista. I mean, you could, you could only just now start to actually require that extend because it was a Vista exclusive thing. And pretty much all games were going to hit the larger area and not just the few people that have Windows 8. So I think when it actually becomes relevant for development, it won't really be an issue because then they will have solved it. And I really hope they do open it up to C Sharp. I do hope they do open up Metraps for XNA, but really for the next two, three, four years, will it really matter for us? Not really. It will have to be a lot of people have to get Windows 8 before it's really a business decision even. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, this, even if it's successful, it's still very far out. I mean, yeah. and I think three years is a good, like, if we launch next year, if it takes a year from now to launch Windows 8, then, I, you know, two years for adoption does not sound like, just before it's significant enough. Because remember, once you go Metro, you don't go back, right? So there's right. no Win 7 Metro compatibility layer. So the adoption of 8 has to be so strong, you're willing to give up on Metro. And as and they're gonna have Nicholas to pointed this. out, DirectX 10 is just kind of getting to that point. XP is dying off enough to where it's it's just now getting to this point. And incidentally, I said something, because uh, you, you mentioned the support for C Sharp. I'd said, you know, our, when RT was going back to C++, and, and I guess that's not accurate, but because you can still use, from what I understand, JavaScript, and you can still use C Sharp, but C++ is Well, not is to dig being... down to DX11. Okay. But if you C++ want DX11 being, at the moment, it seems to be C++. Yeah, it, it's being touted as more of an option, which is very strange because it seems like everything else is moving away from that. So, um, I love Extra Guy. I, I really do love ExtraGuy.com because um, there's no filter on his news posts. If he's going to call something out, he's calling it out, and um, Fortress Craft was on IGN, and some wonderful quotes came out of that as far as how Minecraft is going to fail, because why would anybody buy Minecraft on the Xbox when Fortress Craft and all the other Total Miner and all that are like $3? Ah. You know, why would you pay full price for Minecraft when you can have the knockoff? Well, he didn't say knockoff, but you can have the knockoff for less. Which it's I'm funny how uh, and... it's funny how Walmart doesn't sell anything other than great value Sam's Choice and Equate brands. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> no, they still have Coke. They have Coke aside from Sam's Choice. And guess what? I would buy. That was the, that was the yeah. Joke. Um, although there is some things where I buy Sam's Choice, but that's because well, yeah. there isn't a strong brand that I like. Um, yeah, and and no, that's not so. Extra guys headline though. Fortress Craft creator somehow finds IGM podium. Unguarded, makes stuff up. <laughs> and he's got a big oh. troll face done in Minecraft. Um, that that I, I just had to, I don't know, I just, I love Extra Guy, man. If you want to go, uh, we were, we were sent, um, 
an email. Was it an email? Was it a comment? I don't remember. I think it was about the email. gossip. Yes. Um, that said, like, you should indulge more in the gossip, which I took to mean the rumor email. and speculation. And you took to mean actual gossip. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought, you know, maybe you're talking like actual... Which I don't know that we do a whole lot that I would count as gossip. We do a lot of rumor and well, speculation. We have gossip, but we have gossip. But if we didn't do rumor and speculation, we'd have nothing. We'd have nothing to talk about, you know. Like if we. So if this happened this week. Fact, okay. You know. Yeah. Um, from the VH1, where are they now? Gaming edition. Uh, Radiant Games. Luke posted. Uh, Chillingo is going to publish him. Which you may know Chilling Go as the Angry Birds. Really? People. Yes, they were brought up by EA and, and all of that. And uh, that's awesome. That's a good... Um, they're going to help market and, and push his games. And this is a good ending to the story because these, he was not accepted for Steam. Yeah. Are these new games? Like, is this a contract for new I games? I think is he... he specifically mentioned Super Crossfire, um, okay. which isn't out yet. So it's kind of an enhancement of Beyond Crossfire 2. Um, is is mentioned in that. So, so is it PC or is he looking to target uh, mobile? At this no, point? I think he's going iOS first. I think that okay. will be the first that uh, uh, going in there. But he does talk like they're a good publisher. They kind of know the market, and he gets the benefit of their guidance and wisdom too. Yes, so definitely. you know, not only um, it, you know, they're going to help publishing and awareness, but also help him make a marketable game. And so he's grateful for that. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I still kind of follow them uh, after they succeed and, and go off. Um, so some interesting news this week with uh, patent law changes. I don't know if you read any of this or saw any no, of this. No, I, I saw one of the headlines. And the, the, the big thing is that the United States went to a first-to-file system. Before, we were all what they call first-to-invent. So essentially, when you filed your patent, you had to prove nobody before you had done this. And then if right. you got your patent and somebody proved they did it, prior art, um, then you lost your patent. Um, and it's much more easier from a bureaucracy management standpoint to say whoever files first yeah. has the patent. Um, that seems like that would encourage patent trolls, though. Yes. So that's the downside is um, it's expensive to get a patent. It, you know, there's a lot of litigation. Lawyers need to say it, send it through, massage it, work the system for you. Um, get it to the system, and this will reward the larger companies uh, more than the small guys because the small guys kind of have their idea out and around and shop it around to get revenue in before they can even think about patenting something. And this will just encourage more, um, and in our area, more game patents, more attempts yes. to patent um, game stuff um, on it. So, you know, I looked around and try to find some counterpoint to this and I, I've read some what follow the EFF and things like that on patent law and things like that so I have like kind of a, a cursory knowledge of, of pros and cons and what's going on uh, in well, the system. I'm sure system. if you file there's got to be some you know th they've still got to do the you know the due diligence there. Well to... there's a review period yeah, but where you can prove no I own they this shortened, or I did this like, first. The, I think if I if I read like or something shortened after the patent was issued to like there's a window for challenges or something uh, again so like when the patent goes up there's a period for review where it just goes out like hey we're about to issue this patent does anybody have a challenge uh, before it gets issued but then there's like a window on like after it's issued that got shortened up that again kind of favors large companies that can have teams of lawyers that just review every patent issued to see if they affect their uh, thing there and was also uh, changes that will allow people to re bring up old patent challenges, like the definition of some business process and and method patents change in such a way that like even though you had a patent lawsuit on this and they lost and you were good, now they can come back at you again on like a different count with the same patent okay, or something. So that yeah, so everybody I've read uh, has basically said, like, this is basically the work of the lobbyists. Um, the small guys were cut out of all, there was no representation of small companies uh, and independents in the process of 
filing it, and um, this is shit. This is, you know, I can't find the silver lining. I, I tried to find, like, oh, but there's these other things. You know, it's not doom and gloom, but... I would I would have to, like, this isn't some sort of law that was passed. This is in, happening inside the FTC. Right? No, this is a law that passed. This is a law that passed, so... Or well, at least Obama signed something. Wow, I, I'm kind of wondering, like, what the... It's if called it's the America law? Invents Law. Wow. wonder what kind of spin people are like, putting on it. Because, like, Protect America. It's the Protect America Act. How can you hate the Protect America Act? Uh, America you know? Is. It's no child left behind. America hates America. You know? <laughs> like how, are you going to leave children behind, Dylan? How no. dare you attack the No Child Left Behind Act? Um, I think there should be a rule that you cannot name things anymore. They just have to be called a number. It's Act 154. That would actually be... It's great. Prop 8, you know, for the entire country. It's Proposition yeah. 8. It just... Because there's no spin in the name, you know? Um, yeah. or, or, you know what I like? I like the McCain-Gold Finance Act. You know, I like the McCain-Gold Finance Fine Act. Fine-Gold? The Fine-Gold McCain. It's, it's McCain-Fine-Gold. It's McCain-Fine-Gold because that tells me Republican, Democrat came together, drafted this. This was a bipartisan draft bill. It's not going to happen. Well, in, in today's world, yes, yeah, no. it doesn't happen. It does but, happen, uh, but it makes me hopeful. <laughs> but it does. This actually was a dash. This is a dash act. The full name of it is uh, the Leary Smith America Events Act, which I think Leary and Smith represented a, a Republican and Democrat. I, I don't know that for certain. I don't know which Smith that could yeah. be. Um, um, but, like, yeah, the name America Events Act. I'm like, uh, okay. That's... I just think of those ads you see on TV, like, Invent Help. Would you like to, you know, become an inventor? Then, I mean, it's basically, I, from what I gather, those things are basically Result, professional. Most people don't make any money off of games. Yes, it's just like <laughs> companies that will buy up a bunch of patents or buy up a bunch of rights to products and then, you know, try to sell them. But it's, yeah. So uh, that's, I don't know how this will begin to play out. Um, there, there's also the case of maybe. We need it to play out in the worst way possible. Yes. Maybe we need to see EA suing indie developers and using the patent of either you publish through us or we will sue the shit out of you. Um, mm. And and this, this dark rain, because sometimes you have to break the system to fix it. I mean, sometimes you need that to let it go up to a Supreme Court level and go, wait, this patent law is unconstitutional. I don't think it's just that. I have to. I have to think that it won't be gaming that breaks it. It'll be something that's more mainstream out in the public eye well, that just doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, it could be in, in several instances. But this is another case, too, of we're just getting in line with the other countries. And this is a case where, like, copyright extensions. Yeah. They run around to other countries and, like, hey, can we get you to up your copyright, you know, retention? And then can we get you up right? And then all of a sudden the case argument becomes, well, America's copyright is not on par with the world copyright. And it's like, well, that's because you went to individuals and milked it and then come back with that argument. And yeah. um, It's easy to increase it in one country if you, know, you can increase it other places. Yeah, yeah, it gives you an argument that you really shouldn't have because it's not on the merits. It's, it's uh, not on the merits of the case. It's not a good argument. But that's kind of what was used here too because a lot of other countries are on the first-to-file method. Um, which, you know what, um, make it fair then. You know, your $25 fee, I filed my patent, yep. you know. Um, that they make it expensive is basically saying like, oh, if this was too cheap, then it, everybody would do it. Well, that's an inherent problem in your system of not being selective on the merits of the patent. Yeah. If you knew like, yeah, there's not a shot you could ever get this. Like, it's cheap to file as a nonprofit. It doesn't cost any much to say, my company's a nonprofit. The odds of you being able to pull one over are slim to none on that. So it's not abused, you know? Right. In this case, I wonder if how it's going to play out. Like, it, it, it sounds doom and gloom. Um, I, surely there's got to be a way, you know, like cases where you could pull out prior art in, in certain cases. Not, I don't know how that works, but it just seems like there's got to be. Um, it can't be as horribly broken as it sounds. 
I'm not saying it it's could. not broken. It could be, but I mean, it's not like suddenly patent trolls, you know, it's going to yeah. take effect. So, and, and like I said, everywhere. like I said, you know, reading all this around, I tried to find the like positive posts. Yeah. And they weren't there. I'm not saying and, this is not a positive. I'm saying it's more like a neutral, you know. Um. So that uh, I think that gets up for anything I tagged for news this week. Because like I said, most of it was on the Windows 8 stuff. And I forgot yeah. we covered it without new yes. information. It's just. Without, like, something new covered. Speculation second round. Um, I will say, if you go back and you watch uh, on the build site, if you watch the... It's video number 766. I think it's called, like, an intro to Metro Games or an intro to DX or or something like that. An intro to DirectX 11, an intro to game, something like that. It's an intro to something like that. It has this horrible, horrible speaker. First of all, Microsoft, for what you charge people to go to build... um, you need to send the speakers to some training. Okay, I'm just going to come out and say that. Like, this was painful to watch as somebody who has gone on the speaking circuit, somebody who publicly speaks and hangs out with other speakers to talk about the craft of speaking and getting better and what makes a good slide deck and what doesn't and what works. Yeah. Uh, it was painful to watch all these rookie mistakes. Send your guys to some basics. You know, you, you have several people at Microsoft who do good presentations. And they can hook them up and get them involved in that. If you're going to put them on stage at Build, where people are paying two grand a pop to come to this thing. Yeah. So 766 is painful to watch because this guy is awful. Um, doesn't know his stuff really well. He's really nervous. But what's you the... Know, uh... He keeps pacing and, and has serious issues in his slide story. But 766 is the start of the drama. Because 766 is where uh, James Ashley stands up and goes, I saw all this talk, but where was X and A? You know, I Actually, in the a. video sentence. Yes, it's in the questions part. And the guy, unfortunately, his answer was, well, the X and A is not something we're focusing on, and the bits aren't there in Windows 8. I guess that means pre-installed by default, which... Well... Okay, cool. It was taken a different bunch of different ways you could take that. Saying the bits aren't there to support X and A is not the way to phrase that statement. No. That is not... But again, unexperienced, really nervous, and like, you know, he's off the cuff. And then you can kind of see him, like, wanting to hide behind... Because then other questions start coming in of these really knowledgeable uh, different aspects and facets of DirectX, you know, 9 and 10... Um, of things like that, and they're just coming at it with these bottom questions. But there's a couple more X and A questions, you know, and it just he just digs deeper and deeper, and and saying stuff like his answers are like, well, you know, we're not um talking about what we may do in the future, but we have DirectX 11 and C plus plus, and we're happy for you to use that now. It's like we're happy for you to use that right now. Like, what do you? And unfortunately, like, he's not, like, a guy in position and skill set to answer, which is why I said, like, he's not a good speaker. They're kind of set up, like, he was not the guy it to like break this a, news. He's a, I don't know, I haven't This is the worst this. possible way to break the news that there's no mm-hmm. X and A going forward. They should have had targeted slides and announcements of X and A. Is on the desktop side. You know, it's in the slide. Well, yeah, that, that's what I would here. assume, even no matter what he says, that they're not going to cancel all support. But instead, it was and... left out of all slides, and the whole idea at Build was just don't talk about X and A. Yeah. It, which backfired it, horribly. It reminds me of this This guy I used to work for. Um, like, you know, we I worked on this uh, you know, e-commerce site, and, you know, people would write in, and, and usually the, the emails would come to me, and I'd be like, you know, do you have this product? Well, no, we don't have this. And every time he'd see that, it'd be like, don't tell them no. You know, tell them we have this other product. Like, and it, it seems like maybe that's what Microsoft wanted him to do. Like, don't be negative. And in being negative, like, there's just enough leeway there for conspiracy theories to slip in of, like, you know. Our chat is about to invoke Godwin's Law, I think. Okay, uh, what is because the... we spawned a patent argument of pro versus anti patent, and I think I don't see it, but you know who else was against innovation? We, we, we did Hitler. Yeah, you know Hitler 
was about control. Yes, and Hitler had patents. Hitler was pro patent. There you go. We've taken it to Godwin's law. Uh, because we did have, you know, I think he had uh, other things to deal with. We there did was have a world war. We did have a uh, we'll agree to disagree comment. We did we did get to the point. I can't, you know, because we're in the podcast. I'm not reading on the chat. We get to a point though where somebody's like, "Well, we'll just have to agree to disagree," which is always a great ploy on the internet. Do, which is, do you know you're on the internet? I think that's a, that's a prerequisite of Godwin's law of like agreeing to disagree. The next step is no. World War Two. Yeah. Uh, did you just. <laughs> Next step is World War Two, and that's Godwin's law. You know who was in World War Two? Hitler. Well, that is Godwin's law. Yeah. That any argument on the on the internet, if it goes on long enough, will invoke uh, World War Two arguments no in one, Hitler. No one backs down on the internet; they just stop posting. And yet, you know, here there was we an have... article on ours about Godwin and him coming up with Godwin's law yeah, and I saw actually that. testing and you know improving and all that. Um, so uh, I think that's awesome. I think that's a, a achievement unlocked. Civility on marks. the internet. Yes, we have uh, we, we we have have spawned an argument. Um, before we dive into the new releases, uh, Nicholas, you you you're awake over there? Yep, I'm still awake. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Nicholas is over in Sweden, so once again we have bring on, brought on a guest who is up at like 4 a.m. his time. We we love that. Anything we we talked about that you wanted to get in a comment that we might have uh, talked through? Um, I don't really want to get into commenting on the U.S. patent system because, to be honest, <laughs> I'm not read up enough in it, and that's just a bit of flame bait. So no, I think we covered Metro apps pretty thoroughly. My point of view is still. I watch, look at it in four to five years when it's relevant, and if somehow Windows tablets suddenly start hitting big like an iPhone, then I can start looking at it. But it's like it's in the future. Yeah. You do um, have a request to talk about ABBA. Is there any ABBA <laughs> comments that you wanted to? Um... Uh, ABBA. Well, not really. It was a long, long time ago, but. <laughs> <laughs> we did make good music. The Dancing Queen is timeless. Um, we will not tolerate on this podcast any anti-ABBA comments. <laughs> I think it's sad that that's that's where where the chat. Come on, gone. you have that ABBA gold collection too. Don't no, lie. no. But my my, my point is lie. like like we we <laughs> we achieve civility on the internet, but you know we're gonna <laughs> still make you know stereotypes of countries. Uh, you know. Uh mm. All right, let's get into uh, the new releases for the week. Uh, new releases this week are from uh, September 16th through September 22nd. We didn't have many games this week, but the first one. Oh, the first one up. Oh, which is... The, Angry oh. Fish. Uh, I can't believe Cicely stepped out for uh, Angry Fish. Um, so there are clones. Open me. And then there are ripoffs. Um, Do you have the... well, yeah, I was expecting somebody to, like, pass that over, or pass that over to her, it's although after her dropping the mind. iPad, I don't know if she should open a beer. Um, there are clones, and there are rip-offs, and so Angry Fish is, uh, Fishcraft? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a remake of a game they already released, where... Well, I think it's additional levels, maybe. Maybe whatever I don't know because I played through the second level and the second level was just freaking impossible. And like, but it's like they done. they didn't rip off Not Angry really. Birds enough I don't play that they had Birds. to do it closer. Like I don't know if they looked at Fortress Craft and said, "Oh, the way to a million dollars is rip it off even more." And, and double down on it. And, and no, to anybody listening, I'm not pulling a punch on this. This is a rip off, okay? I have no problem with clones. I embrace cloning. Cloning is a rite of passage in game development. Cloning is okay. But there's a difference between cloning a game and ripping it off. When an 11 year old who has not seen this game before looks at it and comments, Is this a rip off of Angry Birds? Unprompted. Just that by was my on? daughter's comment when she walked in and it was up on the screen, not seeing anything else or anything else. Is this a ripoff of Angry Birds? And I wasn't, I wasn't so bothered by Fishcraft. Like the art style was similar, the the game concept was similar, but it wasn't something that we had on Xbox Live Indie Games. So okay, fine, you know, bring bring Angry Birds. Well, and it didn't work, and we commented that in Fishcraft. No, it didn't work, but it looks like what they did here was like. 
well, that worked. So, you know, like, we're just going to give a big middle finger to Angry Birds. Yeah. Come get us. Yeah, and and um, <laughs> Indie Gamer Chick has mentioned in our chat, too, they put out a teaser trailer video of Angry Fish Rio, which, wow, like, it, when you looked at the logo, it was like you stencil copied the actual font and logo um, from the the Rio edition of Angry Birds. Is there going to be a Rio edition of this, or was that a joke? I don't know, but it was way beyond. Are we the... in? Uh, why did I buy this territory here? I don't think so. Okay. I, it, it it had no parody comment. You know, it had no like we're mocking Angry Birds and the Angry Birds phenomena. The game has no we're mocking. Well, no, 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 no. The There's video. no parody going on in no, any of it. No, it's it's not in and any even of it. The, the trailer Rio or the game still had the feathers on it. There's no feathers in Fishcraft or Angry Fish yes. or whatever you want to call it. There's anywhere. feathers in the logo, and there's no feathers in Fishcraft. Um, I mean, like your fish going against cat. Yeah, I mean that's it. Opens up exactly like Angry Birds, with yes, the, the yes, slow scroll panning um, on that, and so uh, don't expect a video of that if you were wondering. Uh, next up is Pimp RPG, and um, for all you Final Fantasy fans out there, if you've just been waiting to play a pimp but have the mechanics of Final Fantasy, this is your game. Wow. Got, he's got the afro of the dude in 13. Yeah, but I don't think that that's... He doesn't have a chocobo no, in his hair. No, that would but make it cute. A cute stereotype. That that might actually excuse... And some of the language in, in the game... Not, not foul language, just some of the dialect that gets used is kind of like... I don't know if this is wrong. Yeah, it's kind of... It's like, like uh, is this... Is this racist? I think it's is racist. This, I think it might Seems be. Seems that way. Um, but, um, but you know, the, the humor. <laughs> uh, we did do video of this, so if you're kind of curious and all that, we will have video yeah. of this coming out this week. I, I will say, like, what for what they were trying to do, I guess it's kind of a funny concept, but they don't... It, it, it's very rough. Uh, you'll see in the video there are issues with, you know, objects in the game overlapping characters. Um, Improperly. Yeah, the in, during fights you don't. It's not like in Final Fantasy where you have the menu come up and you can act while characters are doing animations. You have to wait, and it's well, and it has the feel of somebody has, who's gone out to some of the the free three D modeling um, yes. sites and grabbed and then like screenshotted. In fact, we mentioned that I believe because there were there's one model, one character model that's like Huge. eight feet tall. Yeah, yeah. It is like two times, like, two and a half times oversized compared to everyone else. Uh, and I don't know if it's intentional or just a screw-up. The scale uh, was different when they downloaded it. Yeah. It was made um, look closer in the mirror. <laughs> next one up is Puzzled Rabbit. Uh, we did video on this one also. Uh, this is a puzzle game on Xbox, so our condolences. Uh, you, you will understand that when you look at yourselves. Um, it's okay, I guess. It's kind um, of a Boxel or a Sokoban clone. Yeah, Sokoban type, move the box into position. Um, not anything really unique, except other than Actually, you can yeah. specify, instead of just moving your character to push the boxes, which you can do, um, you can just say where to move the boxes, and the character will do that automatically. Yeah, and figure uh, out the path. Which is kind of like... I guess you were saying like it's kind of a different way of thinking or something like that. I found it made it really easy. Yeah, it 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 makes it easy in the sense that you don't have to keep you know do a whole bunch of crazy button presses to get where you want to go. It's very quick. But it and if you're a developer, you get it's kind of like the difference between procedural and functional programming, where you have to come at the problems from a different perspective. Like I, I would solve these problems by kind of nudging the boxes around, figuring out. You know where you know where if I move it here, what position does that put me in? And you have to think several steps ahead. And you know, thank God our audience is mostly developers, developers. to even get your reference there. Um, I don't think that plays well outside the developer audience. Our next game up, uh, Project Windstorm, and. <sighs> I like yeah. the box art. The box art's cool. <laughs> But, you know, so that's the, never the, the a good art style. Um, you you jump out of a plane, and then 
I mean, I only got to like the second level because the second level didn't. Whatever I was supposed to do was not explained to me properly because I wasn't right. able to do it. Um, but you you drop out of a plane and you you well at some point you got to hit like both bumpers to launch a parachute and land on the ground, and then you're gonna like fight as you fall down the plane. It looks like so as yeah. you jump out of the air, uh, you're gonna have combat in the air. But I didn't actually get that far. Like the second demo level, um, there's a bunch of crates on parachutes. And after you jump out of yours, you have to cut the rope of two of the parachutes, which is easy to do. Then you have to melee attack some of the other crates. And the melee attack is done with like the B button. And when you're over the crate, and I was able to get over the crate, and it looks like you have to mash it a bunch of times. And no matter how many times I mashed the B button, I never destroyed the crate. And I never got beyond that level. I went out to the help. I reread the help. I reread the, there's some help screens when you start. Uh, there was a very weird thing of like all levels were unlocked at once. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Yeah, you could you could watch the story and then the mission and then or you could just skip the cutscenes and yeah. just. Uh, it's a neat idea. It felt like they were trying to do a whole lot of things and they introduced them too quickly. I personally, and and this is my fault, not necessarily the game's fault. I personally wish that they had had a single help screen like a controller layout instead of introducing them in the mission briefings because it's like no nah, I just want to get in I just want to play feel this thing out yes I, um, again that's personal preference it's not a personal preference it's just kind of a you don't want to read a bunch of text before you can yeah. play you need to limit that and then put the tutorial stuff kind of in game or really focus your intro screen such that like hey in this next screen both buttons parachute right. and that's all that's on the screen and he introduced not them a whole slowly paragraph. In, in in missions but, yeah. our next game up is avatar fighter online uh we played this game it was called avatar fighter yeah we did a review of it actually I believe. we do a full on review me, yes, yeah they sent a uh, it doesn't seem like anything really changed at all, other than it has online play i of can't course. i can't tell anything like that from the uh the trial i mean it still kind of has i'm not willing to say that stuff looks exactly the same yeah it it still has the janky ass um i can really just win most of the fights by mashing the punch button over and over and over again really? and as long as oh, i don't yes. break that timing uh i will take them all down because uh, i suck ass at fighting games and got he like to the final guy somebody yeah because i just kept mashing the a button i, I never like, two punch two punch two yeah. punch two punch uh, maybe on harder levels because i remember when i played the the full version on harder levels i i actually did have to pull out some of the moves and stuff. Moves are really easy to do, but again... It doesn't have a whole lot of moves for a fighting game. It, it has like five. Yeah, the, the neat thing about this game, and, and this is this is bypassing you know just the normal trial thing, is you can use your own avatar, you can customize which move, not just which move set, but you can cherry pick from the different characters' moves. Again, though, if you, if you have the original probably not something you want to play no but you know if you don't yeah check it out if you, you remember what you gave the rating on that i thought it was a try I do not i think it might have been a try because it wasn't 100 percent like great as a it fighting was like game tech and oh early tech and where you had a delay yeah i do i do vaguely remember that becoming an issue as i played it more I'm not a fighting game aficionado. If you like fighting games, it's probably worth checking out. But um, actually, yeah, if you're going to look it up. Yeah, I mean, I've got the database here and uh, get it pulled up in here. Yeah, it's got the same freaking box art. <laughs> um, it was given. What did Game Marks give this one? I thought we had that in our database, but I'm not. Oh, we just did a review on it. Um, I thought I had the Game Marks review score in our database, but I, I guess I didn't. Uh, that's my bad. All right, well, I'm, so, I'm pretty sure it was a try. Yeah, and of course, you know, like, our site's down, so I can't really... Yeah, because yeah, I found the page, but it's like, I'm sorry, this thing is... <laughs> anymore does google have yeah a welcome to the, well, welcome to uh last week sicily thank you for staying up to date on what's happening in the game marks world 
um, <laughs> that uh, the the site stuff is currently uh, gone. Our next one up, uh, we did a video on is Tunnel Vision, and it, it describes itself this way. This is the game a developer. Okay, a try. Um, the the game was uh, it's it's described as a two D shooter in three D. So a 2D bullet rain, yeah. bullet hell type shooter played in 3D. Uh, now none of us, I think, are bullet rain shooter fans. Hell. Um, because uh, we, in fact, like you know, one of the, my notorious reviews basically was to give a fail, a pass to uh, uh, Decimation X3 because I didn't find it worth worth playing. Although I know that game is. Highly loved among a niche yeah. crowd. You know, they're big in Japan. That's true. Um, but yeah, so Decimation X3 wouldn't, you know, any of our cup of tea, I wouldn't find anything like that. So us playing that for the trial, that's going to be a big part of it. Too much going on on screen. Not quite sure where we need to be, how to avoid these things. Yeah, and Bullet Hell is is really weird in 3D because, especially with the tracers on all the missiles, you start this up and just... It's hard to know where everything's at. Yeah, you don't know what's coming at you. You're pretty much certain you're going to die. <clears throat> it's. I think one of the issues I had with it was it's not immediately obvious that there's a life bar. <clears throat> that said, very polished, um, very polished gameplay, and I I had. The fun ship looks with like it. the Nebuchadnezzar from the Matrix. Right. A little props really there. Looks that looks cool. cool. I had I mean, fun with it, but you know so. So I think if you're a bullet hell, like if you like that sort of game, definitely this is worth checking yeah. out because it's kind of a different twist on that. Um, for us, it was not working. Like the move to 3D yeah. uh, was not working, but it might for some. So that's definitely worth uh, checking out. Next one up, pigs can't fly, and uh, I think we proved that in the video. Yeah, Mike can't play this game because um, there's a rhythm. This game wants you to hit. There's a rhythm of diving and flapping yeah. through the levels that you would hit to keep your pig going and extend the levels. Um, but this, it, you don't get enough visual feedback. Yeah, you don't have yeah. enough feedback on when you're doing the things correctly and when you should be timing these presses uh, to, to get into that rhythm it wants you to hit. Unless, it, that, unless we're completely wrong and it's intended to last 90 seconds, which no, I don't think that's the I case. I don't think so. I think, because th there are certain stars that you can see, like certain pickups that we weren't able to hit. Um, so I think we were just playing it wrong. That said, when I when I played through it, <clears throat> you know, you can't get a sense of the rhythm from the instructions. It's just one of those things that, you know, if you happen to just things sync up and, and you happen to hit it, great. But it's not the kind of thing that I can explain what I was doing. It just, yeah, happened. It just kind of happened. Um, if you sit at the title screen, the music actually gets kind of cool, and the music is done by James Johnson, the Mad Ninja Skills, the same one who does, uh, who did the podcast um, theme, the Game Marks theme that we played at the beginning of the show. Uh, he did this as well. Mm -hmm. And when you play the game, you might not typically like immediately click into his. If this it was his, because it's not. If you listen to the stuff that he's done and the heavy techno and dubstep influences that um, um, he plays a lot and he, he does a lot, it doesn't have that to start, but there's like a subtle like remix vibe that kicks in. So it's almost just like worth, like, you know, down the trial and, and leave it open yeah. at the title screen for a little bit to kind of play it. And actually, this is not a bad game to try. It's one of those phone style games where, you know, it's very simple. If you get it, you get it. If not, you will probably, you know, more time is probably not going to help you. It's just going to be think to say it's a Tiny Wings clone, <laughs> like, since none of us are really iOS. What? I am not going to kill the bearded one. <laughs> Who said what? No, 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 no. Who said what now? No, let's finish before we okay. distract. All right. Uh, our last one up this week is Game Frenzy. It's a bunch of mini games. It's a bunch of bad mini games. Yeah. Tic Tac Toe. Pong. Don't think I need these. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's a bunch of bad minigames. 
And it's got Parcheesi on the cover and doesn't even have Parcheesi in the game. What the hell? <laughs> Maybe in the trial? Or am I, no, did I miss it? I don't think I saw ones. Parcheesi as any of the... I thought it was um, one of the last ones. <laughs> they just grab... Nope. It's in the description. I don't see it listed. Um, I like piece of Parcheesi. You, Maybe you, they just grabbed You teased me some Parcheesi and didn't deliver. Um, Sigh. Would Parcheesi really have saved your opinion of this game? No. It's a mini game. I don't know. <laughs> to, I mean, I have, I'm not kidding. I have good family members. We used to have family board game night uh, in my family, and that was one of the ones that was kind of popular. Uh, it's a real basic game, but you can cock block and Parcheesi. You know, yes. you can put two of your colors on a square, and that's awesome for me. Like, I love doing that. And it's not about winning. It's, it's about, about making make others lose. <laughs> wow. Oh, and don't play with me in Monopoly. I've been called a slumlord before. I've had a, a little girl ask her mommy when we were playing. Uh, she wasn't that little. Uh, I, I think she was like 15 when I was 18 or something. Okay, I was going to say, this is not your daughter. No, this no, is not no. a daughter. No. But, um, but my daughters have made comments of like, you know, that's not that fun to play with you. Because um, she actually got a Monopoly board and liked playing for a little bit. Um, but I, my, my strategy, you know, is getting hotels up as quick as possible and buy the low rent areas right. and, and establish that quickly. Oh yeah. I like doing everybody that too. Do that. Um, and you know, everybody else is like, Oh, I want boardwalk and park place. I'm like, well, you know what? I'll just give you boardwalk for Baltic Avenue. Here's just boardwalk for Baltic. The most expensive for the cheapest because that cheapest yeah. will give me both and I will have hotels up and then you will lose money. Enjoy and your, you will uh, never be able to afford a house on Boardwalk. Enjoy your two properties while I own an, an so, entire yeah, This row. little girl asked her mom, well, 15, 14-year-old girl, asked her mom, is this how slumlords work? Basically, I gave her a life lesson. I taught her how slumlords work from we my play of Monopoly. We played Monopoly during Christmas when my cousin would come and stay over with us for a week. And my mom had to institute a no sharp items... <laughs> It's one of those games that goes on forever. Not in our house. Not in our anyway, house. Anyway. Yeah. This wraps up our uh, new releases for the week. Now, this was not a great week. No. It was not as bad, I think, as some of the weeks we had running up to Dream Build Play. Mean- mediocrity is the norm. There were some decent games. There were not a lot of games. So like, We had the highs. We had the lows. We have to go between... Pigs Can't Fly and Tunnel Vision. Um, Puzzled Rabbit Pimp RPG are the only other two that we did video of. So, I did get the rhythm of Pigs Can't Fly. Yeah. And nor did I get the, the bullet hell of Tunnel Vision. Between the two, I would lean to Pigs Can't Fly. I really? think... I think if I got the rhythm of that, um, I could enjoy that game. I think Tunnel Vision would still kind of be a bullet rain game to me, and I wouldn't be interested. Yeah. Pigs Can't Fly is a love it or hate it game, and the fact that all of us kind of hated it or never figured it out, I think it's kind of a niche. It's nice, but I mean, like I said, it's kind of that phone sort of Love it or hate it, it's still an obsession. Okay, yeah. Um, I would have to go... My my first pick would probably be Tunnel Vision for the polish. Second pick, Puzzled Rabbit, just because I like the um, the smart movement style. Wasn't a really flashy game, but I think that's a neat concept that they Sicily, play around with. Where, where do you weigh in this week? About half an hour ago, I decided that I like Pigs Can't Fly more than anything else on there. Just because it's one of those games that... except About half an hour ago? Yes. I think that's when <laughs> I started this. <laughs> uh, for those on the podcast, oh. she just looked at her beer when she was quoting the time. As if that's some kind of indication of, well, this one's almost done, so it must have been about 30 minutes. <laughs> I can gauge time by how much I've drunk. I was going to say, like, this is not a good tagline for a game. Cicely remembers it as being good when she's drunk. Yeah. Well, no, that's actually a pretty good tagline, because if you can remember something is good while you're drunk... 
Well, it's not so that, that it happened. You anyway, it while, okay, that, yeah. that is two strong votes there. Pigs can't fly, number one votes. Um, this being a weak week, a weak <laughs> week. <laughs> We're going to. I think we're just going to have to go to vote. Carries. I'm. I'm cool with that. I. I do think it's. It's a polished game. I just didn't get it. Yeah, but I mean, it's like I didn't get any of the games. <laughs> you know. So, um, there's that. So congratulations, kinda. Two pigs can't fly. You are Game Mark's game of the week. Um, for that. Why were people calling out for my death in chat? I think it was just John. That was no, John. That John. So that was not John. It, it said John yeah. Chainsaw Buffet. Um, he he said something earlier. I looked over and eat a butt and things like that was going in there. No, so. you specifically said kill the bearded one. Although it's like, technically, I guess no. Indy before to me, she the, went off said you did not kill the bearded one, and therefore I am disappointed. Yeah, to me, I don't even think the the troll Dylan type stuff is worth podcast. You know, it was mentioned. Dylan. She um, said the bearded one. You know, the... <laughs> Do people try to tro troll me? Is this a thing that happens in chat? Well, come on. You know the Chainsaw Buffet cast members, and yeah, that's what they do. And, you know... It's Has like, it hey, spread beyond the no. people who actually know me in real No, life? it has okay. not. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, that's your life. You have to live that life. But we'll, we'll spare you that... Um, for a couple hours a night when we're drunk. I'm not exactly not sure. To. Like, unfortunately, what what is the unfortunate part? Uh, unfortunately, for the that I have friends who troll me. Of the 168 the... hours in the week, 166 of those will not be the Game Marks podcast. And there, I'm open to trolling. And you're open to trolling, but we'll give you two hours there. Um, Relatively. Trolling, how do you know you're in BI when you just know there's 168 hours in a week? And that there's eight thousand six hundred and four hundred seconds in a day. That sounds familiar because I, I have used with one of seconds. The bottles. Like it's like a new if you version. Write any cookie code, it's a new version of rent. It's like you know eight thousand six hundred and four hundred eight thousand eight eighty six thousand four hundred seconds in a day, fourteen hundred and forty minutes. Um, yeah, yeah, twenty four hours. Like I said, you recognize this if you've one ever day, had to write any cookie code. We all die of AIDS. You meant rent the musical. I've never seen it. I didn't know what you were talking about. That's what about. happens. I've not yeah, seen no, it either. Yeah, I know that's what happens. I heard, I they all die of AIDS in a year. They all die of AIDS. They all die of AIDS in a year. What does the number of minutes in a day have to do with because rent the Because there's a song musical? in Rent okay. where they count like the number of seconds oh. or minutes. Like the chorus is like 8 million, 700, blah, 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 you know, minutes in a year. And I think Rent takes a case over the year and they all get AIDS in a night, basically. Um, yep. It's wonderful. Go see it. You know, it's better than cats. I love um, cats. Because, I mean, cats should have ended with them getting hit on the street because that's what happens to stray cats. But <laughs> one of them did we die. Took, since we took this fairy tale version, um, I, I could not relate. Uh, do that. And know. that's Mike on musicals. <laughs> Don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> We're way off topic. Uh, before we get away, um, before we, we sign out, Nicholas, any more uh, parting comments or anything that you want to leave on? Uh, not really. I'm probably too tired to keep a good conversation at this time of the day. Um, which is now what? 5? 5 a.m.? 5.30 a.m. I really appreciate heaven. you coming on uh, and... And getting up in 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 the in the in the morning, um, thank you, thank you for uh, coming on the show. Thank you, uh, everyone, for tuning in, and we will be back next week to do all of this again. again.